Hello, and welcome to How I Built This Resilience Edition from NPR. Happy Friday. I hope you are all well. Um, this is where we talk about how businesses are building resilience during this challenging time. And in the window next to me is Brian Chesky, He's co the co-founder and the CEO of Airbnb. Um, we told the story of Airbnb on the podcast back in 2016. It's well worth checking out. Um, as many of you know, the travel industry has been hit pretty hard during the pandemic. Um, Airbnb saw an 80% drop in bookings in April of this year. Um, and in May, Airbnb had to lay off about 25% of its workforce. But there may be some glimmers of, a of hope and a hope to a return to travel in, in parts of the world and even in the U.S. Um, Brian, welcome. Thank you for being here. Well, thank you for having me today. And please be sure to submit your questions if you're watching on Facebook or Twitter or YouTube. We love your questions. And please submit those for Brian, Airbnb, any questions about the travel industry. Um, first of all, how are you... I know that Airbnb is based in San Francisco. You're in San Francisco at your house. How yeah. are you managing operations? You know, this you've got a huge workforce. How are you? How are you just managing the company? Every day I wake up, I shower, then I put sweatpants on. <laughs> I stand sit in a room, and I stare into an iMac for 18 hours a day. <laughs> <laughs> if you were to, it, 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 the story years from now may be exciting if one watched my story, uh -huh. they'd say like, this guy's doing nothing. He's just literally like staring into a screen. And that's all I do for five months. Oh my God. Um, yeah. And yeah. I haven't worn, yeah, I've, I've just, yeah, it's been pretty, it's been pretty crazy. Um, yeah. And, but, I, but what, more seriously, um, this has been by far for, for, for us the most difficult thing that we've experienced since we started the company. We started Airbnb, I know Joe was in the podcast a dozen years ago. And I think Joe and I used to talk about how, you know, starting Airbnb, basically this idea that like strangers would live each other, yeah. live with each other, like that was the hardest thing we were ever gonna do. It was like pushing a rock up a hill. Yeah. And it turned out that trying to run a company that does travel, preparing to go public in the middle of pandemic is about as hard. <laughs> And, uh, and then doing it all via Zoom, uh, just staring into a screen, uh, it was even more difficult. And I think that what people want right now, um, just mo more fundamentally, what people want is connection. I think that's what is, isn't that like the thing that we've always wanted? We want connection to each other. And, um, and, and now you have to fight for it. You know, you have to make a conscious effort for it. And, um, and so that's what, what I do. And I make that conscious effort. I don't bump into people in the hallways. Yeah. It doesn't just happen through my daily routine. And so through these windows into the world, like this one right now, we kind of fight to maintain those relationships. And you know, those circles, you know, on the one hand, I'm closer to some people than I've ever been in my life. You know, mm -hmm. probably closer to my co-founders, Joe and Nate. We talk all the time. And when you're going through crazy periods of time, it has a way of bringing you closer together. But it also has a way of making your bubble a little bit smaller. Yeah. That you that you and I have met fewer new people, well, under the, the context of work. You know, your bubble gets smaller, maybe those people get closer, and that's probably what's happened for me. Yeah. You um you wrote a letter to your employees that is posted publicly, and anyone watching this should read it. And if we can tweet it out on our how I built this um Twitter sure. handle would be great. That um, letter is was remarkable. It was so transparent. You had to lay off a quarter of your employees in May, and you could see how painful it was for you to write that letter. It was extremely transparent. You described the process um, for how you had to make that hard decision, um, but also you know that every employee would receive 14 weeks of, of pay plus severance and insurance for a year and they get to keep their laptops and there were resources to help the employees um kind of walk me through um how you how you came to, to write that letter and um and just how how you kind of dealt with that just emotionally yeah um there is no playbook i don't think to lay people off and that's the kind of thing that if there was a playbook you should never use it yeah. because the thing that people want more than anything is they want humanity, they want compassion. And that means that you need to treat people like, like people like individually and not robotically. And so, you know, when the, when the crisis happened, you know, it happened or when it kind of hit us and we felt it in mid March, um, it was pretty serious. And then something happened 
we spent 12 years building Airbnb and then we lost 80% of the business in eight weeks. Wow. And it, it, you know, we're like, you know, it's one of the success stories, right? And then suddenly eight weeks, there's, you know, all sorts of concerns. There's articles, will Airbnb survive? I never thought I'd read an article like that. But yeah, then again, there were articles like that. And we made a lot of hard decisions. We first cut enormous amount of cost. We um, cut over a billion dollars of planned marketing spend. Wow. And we quickly raised $2 billion, which it's not easy to raise $2 billion. It's more difficult to raise $2 billion when you're a travel company, it's a pandemic, and you've lost 80% of your business in like eight weeks. Wow. People get nervous. And yeah. so um, thankfully, um, we had some great investors step up. Um, but we had to do that deal and that was like over the course of 72 hours to like get wow. that deal done. It was the fastest deal I think I've certainly I've ever done and they've ever yeah. done. So we had to first like before that layoff even happened, I wrote a couple principles and I said, I we, we have a handful of stakeholders. We have to first make sure that we act quickly and with all stakeholders in mind because we can either be we're going to be remembered probably for how we handled this crisis. Andy Grove, this famous entrepreneur said, yeah. bad companies destroyed by a crisis, good companies survive a com crisis and great companies thrive or like are defined by a crisis. And I said, we're not going to be the kind of company to be destroyed by this. So we're going to obviously try to take care of each of our stakeholders. And when we got to the employees, um, we basically had exhausted options having raised $2 billion. Yeah. We came to the conclusion that we would have to do layoff when we confronted two hard truths. The hard truth, number one, was this, that we did not know when travel would return. Yeah. Nobody did. And the second thing we knew is that when travel would return, um, it would look fundamentally different than the travel before the pandemic. And so our business would have to look different and we'd have to ha change that shape of our business and what we focused on. And so then we just realized that we had to approach this with a sense of humanity. I wrote out a series of things that were important to me. I said, all change, all business reductions have to be mapped to the, to the future business that we're going to have, that we're going to hold the diversity and belonging to a highest ideal. And we're going to treat every single person as absolutely personal as one could when it's a pandemic and the main way to connect with people is via Zoom. Yeah. And the last thing I said is we should be, you know, as generous as we possibly could be and not less generous than that. Why would you do that? And so what we came up with was, as you said, a handful of things that we did to try to help people in this very difficult time. We did a, a 14 week severance puts a week per year service. We felt like, well, this is a health crisis. People need health insurance. And so we made sure that everyone had at least one year of health insurance, even yeah. after they were getting laid off. We did some other things as well. Um, one of the things that I'm most proud of that our team came up with is our team that did this is um, Joe and the team came to me and they said, you know what, we have a recruiting team. Maybe we could dedicate a percentage of the recruiting team to find, do job outplacement for the people being laid off. Hmm. Maybe we could basically be an outplacement team to help them find jobs. And then another idea came up. They said, why don't we just take everyone's profile that got laid off and if they want to opt in, we'll publish their profiles and we'll tell recruiters all over the world, like if you want to know like who to hire, our, we have incredible people. Yeah, You'd be lucky to have them. We put their profiles online. A half a million people visited their job profiles. And so presumably a handful of people found the jobs. And the last thing I'll say is writing the letter, I just really wanted to make sure um, I was just brutally honest with them. But I also like, you know, a lot of a lot of times the problem with these things is there's a certain way to act. And the certain way to act is a way where you kind of like you're you're not vulnerable, you know, you don't take too much responsibility. Yeah. You um and I was like, you know, the one thing people want to know is that leaders have compassion because at this period of time, if leaders don't have compassion, then we are all in a very precarious situation. And compassion means actually having heart. Yeah, I actually think business leaders do have heart. It's just that they sometimes have trouble showing heart. And so I used a word like love in a le letter with, with, to, to a layoff. And it's kind of something very few people do, but I don't think it's something very few people feel. It's just that the conventions of business get really cold. But now I think it's pretty obvious that people do want to feel something. Um, 
how, what about the, the, I mean, 1900 employees had to be laid off and so how, and, but you still have a, a large workforce. How are you making sure that, that, that you're keeping morale among the people who, who are still working at Airbnb? Oh, it's so hard. I was warned ahead of time that the hardest, uh, if, if not only is the layoff going to be difficult, but the months after a layoff, and I didn't realize is that when you can't even gather people, that gets even more difficult. Yeah. So um, <clears throat> one of the things I've done is for the last five months, I do a weekly uh, kind of Q&A where I allow people to ask any question they want. And the difference is I, I it, between some some of these Q&As companies do is I said, no matter what question you ask, I have this iMac and it's got like this, you know, what the camera got this little green light next to it. And I said, I'm going to stare into that green light every yeah. week. And I'm going to just tell you everything that I can. And that's going to be our point of connection. And I'll just, we're going to go on this journey together. And I tell people, you're not alone. We're going to go on this together. And even for people that were affected by the reductions, we tried to do what we could. So they weren't alone, um, kind of stepping away and, and, it's it's i think that the key is you have to be optimistic yeah. and optimism is not blind hope but there are a lot of reasons to be optimistic you know when i was a kid my dad used to say to me things are never as good as they seem and as bad as they seem well if that's true things weren't maybe as good as they seemed in january but that also probably means things aren't as bad as they seem here in july i'm seeing the humanity of people the love that's being kind of come through the surface. I mean, you suddenly now in a crisis, we're reminded of some of the things that are most essential. And those things that are most essential are not the things that come in cardboard boxes to our front door. Yeah, That that is essential is the relationships that we have with people. And that's what I'm trying to do is try to just stay connected and keep those relationships. That's what we have at the end of the day. We're taking questions for Brian Chesky. Um, if you're watching on Facebook or Twitter or YouTube, please submit them. Um, let's talk about the travel industry, Brian, and let's talk. Um, yeah. Let's let's talk optimism for a moment. Um, Do it. Um, you know, when we told the Airbnb story on the show, <laughs> you had a lot of moments of despair, um, a lot of troughs of sorrow. You know, oh, yeah. I think originally this is amazing. Airbnb, um, you and your partner sent out 20 emails to investors. Um, to invest and not a single one um, invest in your company. Um, you had several setbacks trying to stand up Airbnb in 2008, 2009. Um, at one point you made cereal, a box of cereal to get attention. Um, so, I mean, clearly there were times in, in, in the founding of this company where you were really coming up with different creative ideas and trying different things out to see what worked. What what's that version of the of the cereal box now? What are some of the things that you are doing as a business to get creative and to think about <clears throat> resilience? Oh, it's a great question. <clears throat> when the pandemic hit, we said we are going to be decisive. Felt like you know, if, if I was a captain of a ship, it felt like suddenly something hit the side of the ship, and you had to move very very quickly. And so it was kind of all hands on deck. <clears throat> the first thing is we had over we had customers cancel over one billion dollars of reservations. Now this would already have been hard, except for the fact that this was a billion dollars that our hosts were expecting, and these people, many of them, depend on to pay the rent or mortgage. Yeah, and we had a huge predicament. What do you do when a billion uh, people want a billion dollars of refunds, and another group of people tell you, well, if we don't get that billion dollars, then we're going to be in a really bad spot. Well, that's a really bad no-win situation. <clears throat> it's not our money. We, we just hold the money. Right. <clears throat> and so what we decided to do is, I, I said, at, at the core first principle here is health and safety. So we didn't want people to feel like they had to travel <clears throat> and feel unsafe. And um, and and people were saying, like, I, I feel like, I, I'm, like I, I'm being made to travel because I can't get my money back. And we don't want that to happen. Right. So we refunded all stays um, related to the pandemic um, where people needed a cancellation because they couldn't travel. <clears throat> but then this caused a huge a shortfall with our host. And we're bleeding cash at this point. Like, and have, never in our history had we bled cash. In fact, we, we had more money in the bank than we raised before the pandemic. Suddenly, we're losing a lot of money. We took a quarter of a billion dollars, $250 million, and we sent it to our host. Just didn't loan it, just sent it to host. Um, it wasn't, you know, they would have needed even more, but it was the most we could do. And so we did that. Then our employees rose up and they 
they offered up to a million dollars of their own money through like things like perks and travel credits <clears throat> to give to our host. And Jonay and I said, well, let's add a zero to that. We got that to $10 million and we created a little special grant program. Then suddenly, you know, we just said, we're going to be useful in this crisis. Like we're not going to be, you know, we might not be as big as we used to, but we can be as useful as we used to. And we noticed that there were nurses, EMTs and doctors, and they were going into hot zones and need places to stay. Hosts were telling us, hey, we can host these people. And we created this program called Frontline Stays to provide housing for frontline workers. <clears throat> we had more than 100,000 hosts uh, list their homes for a discount. We waived fees. Some of the homes were free. And then <clears throat> um, our experiences product gets totally shut down. You know, we have a product that can allow people to do activities at low right. rate. But there's social distancing. You can't do that. Right. <clears throat> Suddenly, our hosts say, why can't we offer them online? Kind of like wow. experience in Zoom. And so we ended up in 14 days offering online experiences. We had previously um, announced a nine-year partnership with the Olympics. We're one of the sponsors. So all these Olympians that were supposed to be training for games, <clears throat> no training to do or not yeah. this year. So we allowed them to participate. And over 200 Olympic athletes offered activities online oh, throughout wow. experiences. So <clears throat> we've been trying to be adaptable. Yeah. And then... You know, suddenly, the last thing I'll say is the following. Our business drops by uh, 80% in eight weeks. And we thought, well, this is going to be a really, really long road. And it is. But something remarkable happened. Businesses started seeing glimmers of hope and recovery. And what ended up happening is people weren't getting on planes. They weren't crossing borders. And they weren't traveling for business. But you know what they were doing? They were saying, I need to get out of the house. Yeah. And they were getting in a car. And they were not going to cities. They were driving to a remote destination within about 200 miles and staying in an Airbnb. And so one of the things we've seen is actually a major mix shift in the travel industry from hotels to homes, mostly because hotels are where you gather. They're typically in cities and they're for business. And if you want to gather with people like your friends, your family, be around the kitchen, be there for an extended period of time, you'll do that in a home. And so we've seen a major surge in bookings in non-urban areas, small towns, rural communities, yeah. um, <clears throat> people staying longer, people saying, if I'm going to work from home, why not just work from any home? Right. And they get that at home on Airbnb. So it's a totally different world. And I think, I mean, the, maybe the most fundamental change that I see in our world that's going to happen is I think that we used to live in a world where almost everyone had a permanent residency. They would try like, if you're if you're if you're so fortunate enough, you know, typically upper middle class person or upper class, you would get to travel for business and someone right. would give you a credit card and you'd pay and you go here for a few days. And then if you're lucky enough, you get to do your one or two week a year vacation. And I think all this is being blurred together. And again, this is only for those that are so fortunate. Uh, not everyone can do this, but for those who can, they're realizing maybe I'll go a month here, maybe I'll go a month there. And you're seeing not only population redistribution, which is essentially redistribution from the mega metropolis to small towns and communities. And I think the 2020s would be the rise of small towns and communities. But you're also seeing travel redistribution, that all these new communities are really welcoming guests and um, they're going to welcome them for a longer period of time. That is a fundamental change in our industry. Yeah. I mean, I'm wondering, Brian, I mean, anecdotally, by the way, just talking to friends, it's very hard to find a home with a pool right? Um, no. Within 100 miles of your, of, of your home. And and I know here in California, Northern California, you know, doesn't matter where you look, it's almost impossible. So clearly You're people totally are sold out in so yeah. many markets, you right? Know, there are a whole bunch of other markets, like in big cities, people aren't going to, but yeah. a small community and the, the, these are totally sold out. So, I mean, when you think about <laughs> where this industry is is going to go when this all shakes out let's say travel is back to normal next summer let's say it's safe and there's a vaccine and we can get on planes and um is is it going to be the same what no. it's not no. what is it going to look like no way it won't be the same um <clears throat> i don't know well first of all let me put it this way i i'll defer to other people that are experts to decide uh, or to, to make the determination of when people are getting on planes <clears throat> and in what volumes. I will say, I highly doubt, and the industry seems to corroborate this, the airline industry, that people are not getting on planes and flights are not returning to levels of 2019 till around 2023, 2024. That doesn't mean people won't travel. If I could predict, 
I'm sure as many people next year will travel as last year, but I do think you're going to have a lot more people traveling by car, by train, nearby travel. And so I think what's going to happen is people are going to, instead of traveling to the same 20 cities, going to the same hotel districts that are really crowded and then standing in line in front of the, to, to get their selfie photo instead of the same landmarks to put it on Instagram and say, look, I got that too. They're going to have to make some different choices and maybe those won't be so bad after all. What they're going to do is they're going to find small communities um, or they're going to, they're going to travel outdoors. For example, there's 400 national parks in the United States, right? Most Americans live within a tank of gas of a national park hmm. and national parks have historically not been the main way people travel. They go to Miami, they go to Vegas, they go to, uh, you know, they, they go to Times Square. Right. Well, I think that if this is a time of reconnection, you know, maybe this is a time of reconnection to family. This also could be a time of reconnection with nature and the outdoors for a lot of people. And so I think that people are going to totally discover the outdoors. I mean, where are we seeing huge growth? Cabins, mm -hmm. uh, airstreams, yeah. camping. This is, you know, I mean, that's not going to happen in the fall when it's cold in the East Coast, but that's the kind of travel that you're going to see. I think this is going to just change trends. I think people are going to want to kind of reconnect to nature. This is a big change. I mean, it, yeah. I mean, are you seeing, I mean, we're seeing a world where, you know, it's impossible to get an RV, right? Like totally. we are totally looked out for these. And, and so is, is there, is there sort of a, a future scenario where Airbnb more aggressively gets into the business of RVs? Oh yeah. A hundred percent. I mean, I would, I don't even know how many thousands of RVs are on Airbnb right now. I'm going to have to look, but we're probably <laughs> without, without having intended to be in that business, we're probably one of the largest, the largest RV rental companies in the world. Yeah. Large, they're not our RVs, it's the communities, but right. yeah, I'm sure thousands and thousands of RVs. We have thousands of tree houses, thousands of RVs, yeah. thousands of airstreams, thousands of yurts, you know, like thousands of houseboats, not wow. just boats, houseboats. So, and I think that people are discovering unique, one of a kind. They want things that are a little more intimate, more local. And one of the cool things about Airbnb is like the most insane space that you ever imagine. These A-frame homes or these like really interesting architectural gems. People, because you don't need to be in any one place because the, every place, the restaurants are closed and the theaters are closed. So you may as well, they're saying, I want to go somewhere with an interesting home. This home right. is in the middle of blank and it's really cool looking. And so you're starting to see some really interesting homes in Airbnb being booked. They're, they're, there is a giant boot that you can sleep in in New Zealand. Somebody <laughs> built a giant boot. It's like a 15 foot high boot. There is a dog that you sleep in. It's called the Dog Bark Park b, &B. Oh, man. It's a 20 foot high dog. And you enter through the dogs, you know what? And it's a yeah. b, b and I think in Idaho, and it's got a waiting list now. Yeah. I mean, look, all of these um, examples are awesome and, and exciting. Um, but I have to assume, like with the hotel industry and the travel industry, a significant part of your business does come from business travelers, right? Um, even our team, when we travel for, yeah. for, for live shows and things, we, you know, we've used Airbnb. Um, so, I mean, how and, and presumably your business is still significantly lower this year, this time this year than it was last year. No, it's not. No, it's not. No, it's no. not. Not significantly, no. Not significantly. Wow. No. no. You, you're seeing, you're already seeing sort of similar numbers right now than you were last year? Yeah. Yeah. It, so we, so it dropped by about 80%. And I mean, you know, nobody knows if this is pent up demand or not, but no, we're, we're, we're around last year's levels. Wow. All around the world? Or uh, it averaged out, you know, Latin America and Asia are lower. Um, North America and Europe are higher. Wow. And that's because people aren't getting on planes. Mix shift from hotels to homes. Um, people like wanting to, I mean, if you want to go to a, if you want to, if you're in a city and you want to go out of the city to a small community, the smaller the community, less likely they have a hotel because a hotel only works with density, right? You need right. a bunch of rooms, you need efficiency. And so people are basically traveling and going the outdoors. They're, 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 they're going to small communities and they're going for leisure for extended periods of time. Well, it turns out that's actually a really good use case for a home. And we try to be very responsible. We work with local governments to have reopening protocols. We hired or brought on the former Surgeon General in the United States, Vivek Murthy, yeah. to create a cleaning protocol. And then people don't want to be in crowds and they perceive Airbnb as a safer option. 
Yeah, we're getting questions um, about that from from our, our listeners. I mean, in terms of cleanliness, how do you how do you ensure that that the hosts are, are keeping um, their their properties clean? This is a, this is a question from Mary Elliot Co Coglin Nauer um, via Facebook. How do you guys make sure that the hosts are are really sanitizing their homes? Yeah, so this is the whole program that we're doing. We launched this thing called the Enhanced Cleaning Protocol, where we developed it with the former Surgeon General, Dr. Murphy, and um, we ask um, hosts to go through basically like an online course. If they go through the course, um, it's got like basic cleaning protocols. They get a badge or a seal on their listing. You'll see it and it says right below the listing, I think it says enhanced cleaning protocol. Um, we also give guidelines. We, we've created gaps between checkouts and check-ins of about 24 hours to, you know, to, to, to make sure that um, obviously there's some gap and people aren't kind of interfacing with each other. And so these are some of the things and now we're working on other things like um, updating a review system. So when people stay, they can rate the cleanliness and did the host seem very responsive. And then we're going to be working on ways to essentially verify the standard of cleanliness as well. That's a little bit harder problem, but there's a whole system that we're working on. Um, I know you've got to head out to a meeting in a moment. I'm sorry for, for people watching that we started late. We had some technical issues, but Brian, um, you know, when you think about where your like where your business is going to be in five years, and and what you've learned from this this time, you know, as a leader at, at the company, um, it's been really difficult. It's been extremely challenging. You're 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 sort of wearing your vulnerability on your sleeve, which I think a lot of people appreciate. What do you want to take with you into the future um, in five years time from now that you've really learned about yourself and your leadership and your company during this during this time period? You know, um, you can learn a lot about somebody in a crisis. I've learned a lot about the people in my life in a crisis. And if it's true that you can learn a lot about a person in a crisis, then it's also probably true that you can learn about, a lot about yourself in a crisis. And I've learned two things about myself. The first thing I've learned about myself is I can handle a lot more pain than I thought I could. <laughs> and it just turns out that like whatever I was afraid of, I think, and this is true for so many of us, whatever happens, I think we can get through it. It, it isn't an old cliche, but we get we we can get through it. And the reason that we can get through things is because we're we're generally not alone. I think sometimes people listening, they probably feel alone. I bet you everyone's less alone than they think they are. There's a feeling of loneliness, but we're actually together. Everything's connected. We're all connected. Sometimes we forget that. So we're not alone. And if you kind of lean on the support of those around you, you can handle so much more than you think you do. But we just live with this perception that we're more alone than we actually are. I mean, most people listening do have connections and we just need to remind ourselves of them and reach out to them. And the second thing I've learned is to kind of the old cliche, but kind of follow your, your own heart, your own intuition. You know, before a pandemic, Airbnb was stretched thin. We were sprawling. We we're going into all these businesses, you know, just kind of feeling pressure of trying to make everyone happy. And the pressure of trying to do everything and trying to make everyone happy kind of makes everyone not really happy at all. And then suddenly you, something happens. You're in a crisis and you can no longer make what I call business decisions. A business decision is, I'm going to make a decision to optimize the business. Well, when you lose 80% of your business and it's a crisis, you have no idea what's going to happen. So then you shift to something else. And that's what I call principle-based decisions. If you can't predict where the world's going, just write out the principles of what you stand for and have faith knowing if you do the right thing that it's going to sort itself out. And by the way, what else, what's your alternative at this point anyway? And so I started realizing that like we just needed to follow our own heart. And that basically told us that like we need to basically focus Airbnb. We need to get back to the basics. We need to get back to roots, back to what is truly special about Airbnb, which is connecting people about belonging. Because we didn't start this company to be a travel company. Hmm. We didn't start this company to be a real estate company. It was about connection. And if it took a crisis for us to get back to that core truth, the thing that I think the world needs now as much as anything, then that's what we're going to focus on. And I think just focusing on like what every one of us is really good at is key. We're not alone and we all have something the world needs and we need to focus on that. That's what I'm going to take out of this. Um, 
that is a natural ending to our conversation, but I got the green light that you got a couple more minutes. I'm going to keep you on. How do I, I can't follow up that. It Damn. was the best ending ever. But, yeah. I, but I got a couple more minutes. I'm going to ask you a couple more questions. We still have lots of questions from our viewers. Um, you know, to this point of, of going public, I mean, is that on the back burner now of, of taking the com company public? No, no, I've, uh, no. When this interview is over, I will be resuming work on 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 that. I uh, we were working on going public. Um, to go public, you've got to write this securities document called yeah. an F one, and it's like a three hundred page uh, page turner. Um, it, 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 it's it, it will it will not it will not compete with your favorite American literature as the Sunday night reading. But um, yeah, it's a, it's a lot of work and it was, we kind of put on the shelf. We were, we we're gonna file it late March. We put on the shelf and uh, recently we've been dusting it off, you know, and and you have to update it because the business has changed. So you've got, you've got to kind of write it more, dif more differently. So that's what I'm doing. And we don't know when we'll be public, but I basically said, um, we'll be ready this year if the market's ready for us. Um, if the market's not ready, we'll be ready when they are. Um, this is a question. I love this question from um, from Jippy of uh, on Twitter. Jippy asks, um, "Have you guys considered having a category of like stay it like house is suitable for work from home or, mm, or stay home point. notice or quarantined homes like a, like a literally a category for those things?" I love that. <clears throat> We've had a couple suggestions about it, and. Um, we have not done it yet, but I love the idea. I feel like this is a good good sign that we should do it. Um, one of the things we now do is, for example, we um, your internet speed never matter, mattered more in your life than it does <laughs> right now, right? So it, it, like Airbnb is like like one of the things is making sure that people know the Wi-Fi speed. So um, over a thousand hosts have already updated the speed of their Wi-Fi um, on their Airbnbs. We want to get hundreds of thousands of hosts just to update. What kind of what kind of internet do you have? What's the speed of your Wi-Fi? Um, what's the buffering rate? Just because some people like they like they have work where they need to rely on it, and then we're going to ask like in reviews to confirm like Wi-Fi speed. So really basic things like that. Yeah, you kind of took for granted before we asked, do you have Wi-Fi? Now it's like, well, how yeah. fast is the Wi-Fi? Because it really right. matters to people. Right. Um, this question from Conrad Holden. Um, he asks, how long will it take for Airbnb to to recover financially? Um, you know, I, I can't go into too much details about financials for the company. Um, you know, um, there's just obviously sensitivities when a company's preparing sure. to go public to talk about financials. Um, so I probably can't say too much about that. I'll just say, um, we're, we're, we're optimistic. Um, and I think that, I think the business will be probably stronger than we were forecasting because there's a lot of these green shoots. Uh, so Fidelity and BlackRock and all these institutional investors who invested, you know, uh, uh, two billion dollars this past spring will probably get a good return on their investment. You think? It, probably not supposed to speculate too much on what you know, what returns, but I, uh, I yeah, I, <laughs> I I always want people to feel like um, we're a good investment for them, and I think our previous investors did pretty well, and those who. Those who could have uh, given us one hundred fifty thousand dollars and owned ten percent of the company and did not, and basically no one wanted that deal. Uh, a couple dozen people did not want that deal. Um, you know, I want I want people to now know that um, you know where there's a lot of opportunity. I'll take that deal. I take that deal, man. I'll we take had that travel. deal. We, had, we couldn't raise any money, and Joe told the story. We had to raise collectible breakfast seal. We were air bed and breakfast. That's what Airbnb stands from. Not yeah. bed and breakfast. Air bed and breakfast. Nobody wanted to like stay in our airbeds, so we said, "Well, let's do breakfast cereal." And we started hot gluing uh, collectible breakfast cereal for the Democratic Republican National Conventions in 2008. And we, Joe and I, we made these Obama O's. They were Cheerios and Captain McCain's, a maverick in every bite. And at one point, we're like literally hot gluing these cereal boxes in our kitchen. I remember wondering, I wonder if Mark Zuckerberg ever had to like hot glue cereal boxes in his kitchen to start Facebook. Of course, the answer was not. This was an ominous sign, but <laughs> kind of we lived through it. And I think you raised twenty thousand dollars with the sale of those cereal boxes. Yeah, like twenty or thirty thousand. Oh, yeah. It was, um, yeah, yeah something like that. Which, which kind of kept. That's why we said um, we were serial entrepreneurs. Yes, indeed. Brian Chesky, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you very much. 
Um, and thanks to everybody watching. Sorry, we weren't able to get to all of your questions. Um, really quickly, a couple of quick announcements. Next week, I will be joined by Samantha B. Um, you probably know who I'm talking about, Samantha B, full frontal with Samantha B. Um, we're going to talk about how she and her staff have transitioned to remote production. It's really, really cool what they're doing on that show. Um, that's at Tuesday, next Tuesday at noon Eastern time right here. So please join us next Tuesday. Um, also on Monday, we're dropping a brand new episode of How I Built This. It's a story of Briogeo Hair Care with Nancy Twine. It is a master class on how to start a business. Take one problem at a time. It is such a cool story. So check that out. Um, and I will see you back here next Tuesday and have a great weekend, everybody. Brian, thank you again. And I uh, hope to see you again one of these days. I got to visit Airbnb. It was so fun when this is all hopefully over. All right. Well, thank you, guys. Thank you for having me on. Bye, everybody. Bye.